So good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for the invitation to speak here this afternoon. And thank you for your patience, too, as I speak to you in English. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I'm frustrated by my own lack of understanding of Swedish because I could tell from snippets and what was on slides that it's very clear that we're thinking about um, the same opportunities and challenges in the development of infrastructure. So I work with the National Heritage Science Forum in the UK and I'm here to share the UK's experience of developing infrastructure for heritage science. So first, it's clear that we like to think big in this field. Um, and um, this slide is really about sort of where to start. And so I was loving um, Philip's uh, descriptions earlier about the scope of archaeology and archaeological science. You'll be pleased to hear that I'm not going to go back quite as far as 4.6 billion years. But this recent image from the James Webb Space Telescope taken in July 2022 seems fitting as an opening slide for a couple of reasons. It was variously reported in the press as an image of the dawn of time. And I thought it a good picture to use as I reflect on the beginnings of heritage science in the UK. And it's also, of course, an example of the use of the very latest technology to look back into the past, something that I'm sure resonates with you as a heritage science community. Over the next 40 minutes, I'm going to share information on the development of heritage science infrastructure in the UK showing what the heritage science dots are in the UK and exploring why we want to connect them. What will the end picture look like? I don't have an answer for that at the moment, but I will share where we are up to in terms of the developing UK conservation and heritage science infrastructure. And in preparing for this presentation, I started my reflection on the evolving heritage science landscape by reacquainting myself with a report on a series of witness seminars that were carried out in 2020, 2010 sorry, on the theme Development of Science and Research Applied to Cultural Heritage between 1947 and 2007. This sought to explore and capture individual and collective memories of the development of science and heritage with a special, although not exclusive, focus on the UK in the second half of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century. And I was instantly struck by the opening sentence of that report. From the end of World War II up until the present day, the development of the application of science to cultural heritage, which may be interpreted variously as archaeological science, conservation science, building science, and more recently heritage science, has ebbed and sometimes flowed according to changes in policy, the economy, and socio-cultural priorities. And this sentence still has resonance 12 years later. The terminology, what do we mean by heritage science? Who and what is included? The ebb and flow over time, the opportunities and challenges that result in different levels of activity, and the impact that policy, economic, and socio-cultural priorities have on the development of heritage science research and infrastructure are all very live issues. As context to the witness sessions, Dr. David Saunders, previously of the British Museum, provided a chronology of the, emergency of, of the emergence of heritage science and referred to examples of isolated analyses of museum objects and in situ archaeological material in the 1800s, the use of x-rays towards the end of the 1800s, studies of binding media in the early 1900s, and investigations in the 1930s by the British Museum and the National Gallery. There are then references to the emergence of radiocarbon dating in 1949 and the impact of the development of chronological investigations and understanding of materials. The establishment of a radiocarbon laboratory at first the British Museum and then the Research Laboratory for Archaeology in 1955 at the University of Oxford. And my point in this is that whilst heritage science is relatively new, its use in the UK being a 21st century development, the practice of heritage science is not particularly new. And from the outset, it has crossed disciplines and taken place in different types of organisation, particularly in the UK in heritage organisations and academic organisations. As part of his review of the emergence of heritage science, Dr Saunders observes that until the late 1980s, the scientific study of objects and their deterioration in the UK was largely carried out in museum and gallery laboratories 
although the examination and analysis were taught as part of university courses, particularly in archaeology and conservation. And it wasn't until the late 1980s and 1990s that there was a significant increase in the role played by university researchers, with conservation courses appointing scientists to teach and carry out related research, and university researchers becoming involved in collaborative projects, bringing not only their scientific expertise, but also their experience in applying for funding. And David proposes that this expansion also brought challenges, writing, the great expansion in activity in the last two decades has seen extraordinary advances in the understanding of material nature of our heritage and the communication of this to the public, although the physics of and mechanics of objects and their deterioration is still rather less well understood than their chemistry. However, these advantage, advances have also brought with them fragmentation that cannot easily be addressed through channels developed in the 20th century. Institutes, journals and conferences have proliferated, creating a compartmentalization. In this climate and with no umbrella body for the heritage scientists in the UK or internationally, there has been little overall coordination of research and no obvious forum for its development. So our starting point is that heritage science research and practice is dispersed across the UK as the field has expanded, and so it has become disconnected. The very same attributes, those of multi and transdisciplinarity, that make it such an exciting field and one of great potential, can also make it harder to understand or maintain oversight of the field's potential and the connections between different areas of research and practice. These challenges were explored in a House of Lords Science and Technology Committee inquiry into science and heritage in 2005 to 6, which I'm using as my first dot on the UK landscape. The inquiry looked at the contribution that science and technology can make, not only to the preservation of cultural heritage, but also to promoting new and exciting forms of public engagement with both cultural heritage and science. It noted that a drive towards increased public access to cultural heritage brings with it an increased risk of damage, which means that input to science and technology is particularly desirable to protect and enable access to cultural heritage. And the inquiry was really important to us because it took a comprehensive and wide-ranging look at the issues. It looked at the decentralised nature of the heritage sector in the UK and its governance, it looked at the distribution of heritage scientists and also the size of the sector and the issues with assessing that size. Of course, this is the challenge of multidisciplinarity and where do we draw the boundaries? It looked at funding for research and trends in funding, international comparisons, UK policy connections, the visibility of heritage science, both government and research funding, and the need for and role of collaboration in the field. It looked at the different perspectives of research between uni university-based and museum-based scientists and questioned whether this was sometimes a barrier to establishing good understanding and developing effective collaboration. It looked to at the impact of academic, academic analog status, which is something that came into play from 2005. Um, this is where organisations that are not higher education higher education institutions can participate in research council projects and they're called independent research organisations in the UK and a lot of the museums and galleries have, have worked for that status. Um, it looked to at the skills base, the way that research is assessed in the UK and the way that the uh, results of heritage science research are disseminated. It looked at the need for a clear champion for heritage science and conservation and it looked at the role of our Department for Culture, Media and Sport and that of the research councils. It also touched on ICT and the heritage sector, documentation and digitisation. And finally, it looked at the need for a strategy for heritage science. And the inquiry exposed what was termed a fragmented field, lacking overarching leadership and vision, and that rather bringing together the arts and sciences in a beneficial collaboration Heritage science appears itself to be in danger of falling between two stools. The report made many recommendations, amongst which were explicit reference to the need to conserve cultural heritage by DCMS, that was our govern, uh, government department, formal appointment of AHRC, which is the Arts and Humanities Research Council, as the Research Council for Heritage Science, 
um, AHRC is now leading um, research council activity in the field. A dedicated program for funding for, for research in science and heritage, um, and that came into play from 2007 to 2014. And the development of a heritage science strategy by the cultural sector, which was published in 2010. So it was a transformational moment for us, leaving us with good intelligence on the status quo, constructive recommendations for change, and a really powerful advocacy tool. And it's been used to good effect. Which brings me to my second dot, the Science and Heritage Programme. This was a seven-year strategic research programme funded jointly by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Engineering, Physical and Sciences Research Council in the United Kingdom. It was a dedicated programme of funding for research in science and heritage, as recommended by the House of Lords Inquiry. And it was established to fund research activities to deepen understanding and widen participation in research in the field of science and heritage. It aimed to strengthen and develop interdisciplinary research, increase the number of researchers in the field, and communicate new knowledge to policymakers, practitioners, and the public. So it ran between 2007 and 14 and was an 8.1 million pound investment. Its objectives were linked to the findings of the um, science inquiry, heritage and science inquiry, um, and it aimed to overcome a fragmented research base by developing the hybrid heritage science research discipline to develop a significant understanding of the relationship between cultural and scientific research questions, and in doing so, make contributions to the theoretical, conceptual, applied and empirical study of heritage science, and to create shared debate amongst the arts, humanities, science, technology, engineering and mathematics communities to address issues of importance to those working in or with heritage settings. It aimed to increase the capacity of heritage science by developing a vibrant research community, address national research priorities within an international context, and facilitate connections, communications, and exchange by bringing academics, researchers, and individuals from organizations outside of academia together. And finally, it aimed to increase public engagement with science and research by contributing to public awareness of the research and project-based outputs and events. There were four delivery mechanisms for this program, collaborative research studentships, which were three-year studentships leading to the award of a PhD, research clusters, which were intended to act as a catalyst for building community around a number of research themes, um, interdisciplinary research grants, supporting five to eight collaborative projects of up to three years, and postdoctoral fellowships to enable outstanding early stage researchers to carry out research and establish an dependent research career in heritage science. And this too was transformational for the UK landscape, with results being research outputs, you can see 48 projects, strengthened research collaborations um, involving over 300 researchers, 234 institutions, 50 industry partners, and of course to boost to the sector's skills and capacity. Also flowing from the House of Lords inquiry, with the development of the National Heritage Science Strategy in 2010. Three evidence reports were commissioned in 2009 to inform the development of this strategy. The first of those looked at the role of science in the management of the UK's heritage. It summarised the range of UK heritage assets and gaps in knowledge and practice, and therefore research needs. It looked at the use of science to understand our, enhance our understanding of the past. And this involved a review of the drivers for scientific investigation and the range of techniques available to address the questions with recommended areas for improvement for tools and access to equipment, raising awareness of existing techniques, data use and its management. And the third area was the understanding of capacity in the heritage science sector, covering issues of capacity across movable heritage, the built historic environment and archaeology, the numbers of people, the type of work they do, the gaps in capacity, where demand exceeds provision, arrangements for funding, training, and again, suggestions for improvement. From these reports came the Heritage Sector's Strategy for Heritage Science, which had two objectives, to demonstrate the public benefit of heritage science and increase public engagement and support for it, and secondly, to improve partnership within the sector and with others, by increasing collaboration to help practice make better use of research, knowledge and innovation, 
and to enhance resources, funding, and skills. There was also a recommendation in the National Heritage Science Strategy to establish a National Heritage Science Forum made up of the users and doers of heritage science so that the many institutions that play a part in the heritage science sector can share a sense of ownership. And so the result of the strategy was more evidence of research gaps or needs, evidence of where improvements are needed in tools, techniques, access to equipment and expertise, an understanding of capacity, funding and training arrangements, and a strategy document that again can be used for advocacy. So although we are not explicitly talking about a research infrastructure at this stage, I hope you can recognise that these were important building blocks. The National Heritage Science Forum um, was seed funded by the Science and Heritage Research Programme between 2011-13. And as a result of the additional investment by AHRC, the forum was founded in 2013 as a registered charity. So we're coming up to 10 years next year. NHS charitable purpose is to bring organisations together and promote the effective use of their resources to promote understanding, preservation and conservation of UK cultural heritage for the benefit of the public. It does this through its heritage science focused activities and it's a vehicle for delivery of the strategy. So in addition to being a charity, NHSF is a membership organisation. It currently has 18 members, which, as you can see here, are heritage organisations, higher education institutions, public sector bodies and charities. Since 2013, NHSF's activities have been funded by member subscriptions. This gives the forum independence and a relative amount of stability. Although it means its resources are limited, and its membership, we recognise, only represents a small number of the UK organisations that engage with heritage science. Between 2013 and 17, the Forum had three strands of activity. It focused on policy, partnerships and resource sharing. And these three strands were the um, routes through which members addressed the goals of the 2010 National Heritage Science Strategy. Specifically, um, the forum acted as a joined up voice on policy issues, so where evidence or responses are needed on issues that impact the heritage or science parts of heritage science. We also provide condensed briefings on policy documents issued by government and others, highlighting the contribution of or impact on heritage science. We bring people together around live policy issues, such as connections to industry, or the evidence for the role of culture in improving health and well-being. The forum worked with the UK heritage science community to map research since 2009 against the gaps identified in the strategy, also collect information on funding, uh, both amounts and its source. It shares information on the research priorities of its members to encourage collaboration. And it supports wider access to research. It has provided grants for gold open access publication of articles, it brought people together around the issue of fair data for heritage science, and it provided training sessions on using content sharing platforms such as Wikimedia to open up awareness of heritage science techniques and their application. It has encouraged resource sharing by establishing an online database that holds information on equipment held at member organizations. And anyone can access that information. It provides information on training opportunities, the range of opportunities available within the field of heritage science to encourage new entrants to enter the field. And it's commissioned research on career pathways to help to understand the experience of people undergoing training and who are early on in their careers. All of this is supported by communication and engagement through a variety of different channels aimed at different audiences, such as our website, social media, and blogs which tie into wider activities, such as the annual British Science Week. And so the impact of the forum is collaboration by the sector on common priorities as set out in the National Heritage Science Strategy, pooled resources to help deliver some of the goals of the strategy, and a focal point for engagement with policy-related activity. By 2017, 
it was apparent that there, had, that there had been significant change in the policy, economic and socio-cultural operating environment for heritage science in the UK, and that we needed to strengthen our ability to connect to current priorities and drivers of change. The forum therefore led a review of the 2010 National Heritage Science Strategy during 2017, and through a process of member input and wider consultation, developed the Strategic Framework for Heritage Science in the UK, covering the period 2018 to 23. As was the case for the 2010 strategy, this framework is for the sector and not just for NHSF. It has three strands, excellent research, a skilled and diverse heritage science community, and demonstrable social and economic impact. And it's an outcomes-based framework, which means that each strand has a number of desirable outcomes or change that we want to see achieved. NHSF itself has identified a number of these that it can contribute to, but it also monitors where there is work elsewhere that will help to achieve the desired goals. Under the community strand, we've held events targeted at emerging professionals to build on careers, set up communications network for them on Slack, we run a series of research presentations to help them discuss and promote their own research, we set up a pilot mentoring scheme, and in partnership with the National Archives in the UK, we have recently commissioned research into how heritage science links to the school curriculum for five to 11 year olds, which has resulted in a matrix of connections, which we are now using to try and uh, promote and increase the use of heritage science in education-based activities. Under the impact strand, we've been looking at ways of measuring impact, uh, different views on the value of heritage science, and audiences to whom the community wants to communicate evidence of impact. The aim here is to produce a toolkit which will be used to support consistency in the collection of evidence of impact. And under the research strand, there's been work to identify five societal challenges for heritage science research. These are sustainable development, the climate emergency, improved well-being, equality and inclusivity, and digital society. And the goal here is to show how the relevance um, of heritage science to these big issues and to find points of connection to other disciplines and other research agendas to encourage an outward-looking sector and the growth of interdisciplinary research and collaboration. And the other principal area of activity under the excellent research strand is physical and digital infrastructure. Although many of the preceding activities I've spoken about have helped to strengthen the UK's infrastructure, this outcome is more explicit in its reference to infrastructure and the facilities, knowledge-based resources and networks, digital or otherwise, that are needed. NHSF has devoted considerable energy towards supporting the development of UK heritage science research infrastructure over recent years. And I will speak about this in more detail, but first, I need to mention that uh, there are several other groupings in the UK that are active in the field. This slide captures most of them, and it's why the strategic framework was developed as a framework. It was important that different groupings with their own areas of focus could connect into the framework, so that we could show how collective sector activity is making progress against the different outcome areas, which are common goals. So I know you're most interested in infrastructure development in the context of today. And this slide really marks the starting point of the connection of those various dots that I've mentioned so far, each of which marks a step forward in our understanding of the current situation and our readiness to make changes. So first, a part of the landscape shift I mentioned that promoted or prompted the review of the 2010 Heritage Science Strategy. There have been wider infrastructure developments in the UK and internationally that have provided a significant opportunity for us to develop heritage science infrastructure. In 2017, the UK government published its industrial strategy, which articulated a commitment to investment in research and development. In 2018, there was the launch of UKRI, UK Research and Innovation. This is a non-departmental government body sponsored by the Department for Business and Industrial Strategy. And UKRI was formed to convene, catalyze, and invest in collaboration to build a thriving research and innovation system. It brings together seven research councils plus Research England and Innovate UK. And this connection is a good thing for a field like heritage science in which we still hear that sometimes the science is too heritage for the science programs and too science for the heritage programs. UKRI's role is to drive collaboration amongst the individual research councils and to address interdisciplinary challenges. 
all research councils have research infrastructures. And in 2019, UKRI undertook landscape analysis of UK research infrastructures, and in 2020, published a summary report of that analysis, together with an opportunity report, which reported across all areas of potential UK infrastructure investment. In the social sciences, arts and humanities sector, the report recognises collections in GLAM organisations, which are galleries, libraries, archives and museums, recognised data collections and the role of universities as all being research infrastructures. And furthermore, it specifically mentioned that heritage science infrastructures can act as bridges between the humanities and sciences by using scientific analysis and technological innovation to understand, manage and communicate the human story expressed through landscape, buildings and artefacts. Within the Opportunities Report, there are themes on maintaining and preserving cultural heritage and one on physical storage, conservation and access, with the latter identifying conservation heritage and archaeological science research facilities and UK research infrastructure for heritage science and advanced storage facilities for museum collections as ways in which progress could be achieved. This was a really significant step in raising the profile of heritage conservation and heritage science research infrastructure and starting to articulate the opportunities to be derived from investment in them. Meanwhile, of course, there's been significant activity in Europe and internationally. And I know you, that you are familiar with ERES and the infrastructure related projects and initiatives that have paved the way towards ERES and ensured a strong and collaborative European research community. The UK has a long history of involvement in these projects, having taken part in all of the projects on the right of this slide. From Labs Tech in the fifth framework from 2001 to 4, and EU Arc Tech in the sixth framework, and Charisma um, in 2009 to 14, through to Ariadne, the Advanced Research Infrastructure for Archaeological Dataset Networking in Europe, and to Parthenos in 2015 to 19, pooling activities, resources, tools for heritage, e-research, networking, optimization, and synergy project. I just love those. <laughs> um, and our Perian CH, the integrated platform for European research infrastructure on cultural heritage, which also provided training and access uh, to wide-ranging, high-level scientific instruments, methodologies, data, and tools for advancing knowledge and innovation in preservation of cultural heritage. And then, of course, there's ERAS itself. Um, the UK was a partner in the 2017 to 2020 preparatory phase project with participation coordinated by UCL, which is University College London. The development of ERAS and its inclusion um, on the ESPRI roadmap in 2016 have been really helpful in terms of building support for infrastructure development amongst the UK community. ERAS UK brought together organisations, universities, heritage organisations and large facilities that could be potential UK infrastructure providers. And it worked over four years of the preparatory phase project towards the development of the ERAS ERIC. NHSF and ERAS UK worked together via a strategic partnership to ensure good communication and to consult across the UK heritage science community and to continue to make the case when needed for benefits of direct participation in the ERIC. Aside from the preparatory phase work that was achieved in terms of governance um, and the future of the ERIC, the project has really helped the UK community to think about what infrastructure in the UK would look like. We undertook some mapping of heritage science capability in 2019 to build a picture of what already exists and where there are gaps across the four ERIS platforms. And it's good that ERIS is moving towards implementation and development of the ERIC. The community um, in the UK wants to be able to participate in this. And of course, this is demonstrated by our continuing participation in Iperion HS as both a provider and accessor of heritage science infrastructure. Separately, we are still waiting for confirmation of the UK's association to EU programmes such as Horizon Europe. And association remains the UK's prevalent preference um, and the UK government has extended its guarantee to cover all calls closing on or before the 31st of December of this year. In addition, uh, the UK continues to be involved in the JP on cultural heritage, connecting to that through the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So moving on to AHRC and its work on the development of research infrastructure, this is where the bulk of activity is happening at the moment. 
at the point when UKRI announced its roadmap for investment in infrastructure, which was 2018, AHRC didn't have a recognised infrastructure programme or portfolio of capital investment. Since then, it's led a wide-reaching programme of research and consultation over three years to understand existing infrastructure, the need for infrastructure investment, demonstrate the benefit of that investment, and scope the shape of the potential infrastructure. This slide charts work done to scope infrastructure up to a report in 2021. AHRC conducted community consultations specifically around infrastructure in 2019, and these are the results that fed into the UKRI's landscape analysis and the opportunity report that I referred to earlier. As a result of that consultation, heritage has been identified as a priority area for investment, and within that, heritage science has been identified by AHRC as one of three areas for infrastructure investment, alongside the creative industries and digital and data. In September 2019, AHRC convened an event on conservation and heritage science, at which there was strong support for a coordinated UKRI-led investment in conservation and heritage science for the establishment of a distributed national institute underpinned by significant investment in four areas of infrastructure, research, skills, and craft. And that was an important meeting, meeting because it got represent, uh, representatives of the other research councils to attend it. So again, it helped to raise the profile and value of what heritage science can achieve amongst other infrastructure providers and funders. Outline concepts were delivered, uh, developed in 2019 to 20, and in 2020, AHRC convened, convened, uh, convened a scoping group to help to refine and develop further the case for infrastructure investment. That looked again at gaps um, or deficiencies in current provision. Um, it provided data and analysis on international models that the UK might uh, usefully draw on or not draw on. Um, and it prepared a selection of case studies about the evidence of the contribution of conservation and heritage science across economic impact, society and culture, advancing technologies, frontier knowledge, well-being, and sustainable growth, those being priorities for UKRI. It also worked towards an outline five to 10 year program encompassing four key strands, that of infrastructure, research, skills and craft. And this formed the basis of a request for major investment to the UKRI board in July, 2020. The outline was presented to the infrastructure working group in 2020, that's UKRI's infrastructure working group. And that was to test the idea of the investment in, in, in an institute for heritage science um, research and to ensure that the work was complementary and not duplicating activity in other research councils. And whilst this was still under consideration by UKRI, the concept was also tested through two virtual community discussion events in November and December 2020. The outcome of the Infrastructure Advisory Committee meeting was that it was agreed that investment in heritage science and conservation research infrastructure is strategically important, and it should be prioritised for funding. It recognised that further detail on the proposal and the benefits of the investment to address this were needed, and AHRC funded three fellowships, um, the fellows' tasks being to collect the additional information that was needed. Each of the three fellows focused on a different component of the infrastructure, which broadly followed the ERAS platforms. So one looked at fixed lab and MOLAB facilities, one looked at Arc Lab and DigiLab facilities, and the third focused on governance. They worked between March and July 2021 to collect additional information, and this is summarised in a scoping report, which can be found online, and I've got a reference to that at the end if you're interested, and from which this diagram comes. In the course of their research, which involved mapping and consultation, the fellows noted the previous data collection exercises and engagement with the concept of heritage science infrastructure had tended to be dominated by IROs, so those independent research communities, um, organisations largely in the uh, museum and gallery uh, sector. And despite, this was despite a substantial amount of the actual infrastructure being hosted in higher education institutions. They also noted that consultation had been therefore informed mainly by the needs of those that would potentially deliver the infrastructure with relatively little input from potential users, um, for instance, smaller heritage organisations. 
The team therefore carried out further consultation um, in May to June 2021 and ran a series of workshops to understand how consultees envisaged that the infrastructure would unleash the potential of heritage science, understand barriers and enablers, and gain their views on emerging models of governance, uh, functions and principles. A series of case studies was also commissioned to capture examples of the range of public value created by heritage science um, in advance of, of work on the economic case. So what did the mapping and consultation reveal? Um, it revealed that all branches of science are used in heritage science and conservation research and are applied across the full range of heritage types. That the UK does not have a centrally integrated heritage science infrastructure at present and centres of expertise have grown organically, resulting in a dispersed landscape. The range of technologies used is diverse, with over 100 analytical technologies, techniques or tools in regular use. And the technologies are applied in more than 20 subdisciplines, with many overlaps between these subdisciplines. Most of the technologies require some degree of specialist technical knowledge for their productive use or data interpretation. And people are therefore critical to the infrastructure, in addition to equipment. Specialist and high-tech facilities are found in broadly five types um, of area. They're university-based, they're with national institutions that steward heritage collections. There are the big um, STFC, Science Technology Facility Council facilities, so these like synchrotrons. Um, there are other national infrastructure facilities and there are commercial facilities. And research is carried out unsurprisingly at locations across the UK, although the mapping of where precisely those technologies are should be an ongoing function of the infrastructure itself. It also built the case for why um, to invest in, the, in a distributed infrastructure and what the benefits would be. The study proposed that research infrastructure would result in transformation in connectivity, so that's collaboration and connections between knowledge data and researchers, um, improved connections with beneficiary communities, better relationships with industry, and better relationships with other UK infrastructures. It would result in transformation to access, improved mechanisms and resources to support the full use of equipment, um, access to equipment for a wider community of users, and logistical smart support to smaller organisations. It would promote open access to data and discoverable collections for scientific study. It would result in transformations to sustainability, with equipment being used to its technical potential, um, equipment being better supported by technical staff, better career opportunities to keep talent in the sector, long-term data storage, and new technological innovation to address needs. And it would result in better impact, with outputs monitored to demonstrate the societal value of research, research itself better understood, and research feeding into practice and commercial opportunity. And better international links within recognised European and global infrastructure. And whilst this was going on, there was another concurrent strand of activity. AHRC developed and launched the Capability for Collections Fund, known as CAPCO. This was a program of capital investment in the renewal and upgrade of research facilities within UK galleries, libraries, archives, museums, and universities. There was 25 um, million pounds of investment, um, which was part of a one-off 300 million pound investment by UK government called the World Class Labs Program. Um, and it, that investment contributed to the, to the strategic vision for investment in arts and humanities infrastructures that was set out in the opportunity report I referred to. So you can see that these things are all layers and building upon each other. There were two elements to that initial call. Um, the first was upgrade, uh, major upgrades of up to three million pounds per bid. And then the second strand was um, urgent replacement or upgrade of core equipment between 10,000 pounds and a million pounds per bid. Um, the call opened at the start of September 2020 and closed in mid-October, and spend had to be achieved by the end of the financial year at the end of March 2021. So this was a hugely quick turnaround time, and if you remember what was going on in 2020-2021, it was very challenging for the organisations in terms of their response to it. Um, but it was also very successful, so there were 48 funding awards made, 42 institutions across the UK. Um, and there are examples of the awards that, that were made on the UKRI website um, and also in the individual organisations that received them. So we're really trying to raise the profile of the benefits of, that this investment has brought. 
It gave many institutions the chance to update old equipment and to develop new facilities. And whilst the Grant Corps did ask about collaboration and wider access, this programme of funding is not specifically linked to part of the wider distributed infrastructure work. The awards were followed um, with a subsequent call for public engagement projects. So again, we're still keen to raise the profile of the infrastructure um, investment, albeit at individual organisations. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing the results of this work being shared more widely as several of those projects are now coming to or have recently completed. Three minutes left. Where are we now? Okay. <laughs> Riches. Uh, we've changed the acronym. So this is the research infrastructure for conservation and heritage science. Um, until between 2022 and 2025, there's plans to invest um, 481 million pounds into a portfolio of research and inv innovation infrastructures. That's not just heritage science, I, has, I, I add. So this proposal uh, for Riches um, was submitted by AHRC to UK Research and Innovation in 2021. Um, and a proposal, the proposal that was submitted in 21 has uh, received the green light for business case development. So that's the stage um, that we're at now. The vision for Riches is that it is transformational investment to address fragmentation within the sector with three components, um, a networked distributed infrastructure facility, so those are fixed lab and MoLab and expertise, a central strategic hub, which plays a coordinating function and digital connectivity. And the, the distributed infrastructure model will build upon and bring together existing and new facilities and expertise. It will consolidate and promote multidisciplinarity. And it will provide a means of engaging the whole heritage science community and exploit geographical distribution to promote and widen accessibility. So it's currently being budgeted at 15.8 million over the next three years, um, up to a total of 59.5 million for future years. Um, and it sort of operates over a 10-year time period. Since the scoping study, there's been a lot of intense work to develop the business case associated with the potential investment because we have to go through government processes to make that case. Um, there was a call for an expression of interest in riches over the summer. And this was um, a further data collection exercise, um, but really looking in a more targeted way at existing cap capability and what the investment needs were. And it also explored the potential to form partnerships as a mechanism of, de of delivering those facilities. Um, AHRC ran another series of workshops over the summer on the benefits of the infrastructure um, and as a start to begin the process of engagement with a wider potential user community. And I think one of the um, things that really came out of that process was that there isn't a clear delineation between the providers of infrastructure and the users of infrastructure, in many cases at the same organisations. So as things stand, an outline business case was submitted in October and this is currently going through review. If it passes this stage, it will move on to full, full business case development. So Riches is our means of connecting the dots for infrastructure in the UK landscape. And there's been a process of development since 2005, with each of these dots contributing something new in terms of our understanding of the landscape, how it can be supported and how it can be improved. The resulting knowledge and the collaborative relationships that have um, been derived from that work leave us with a good foundation with which to transform the UK's heritage science infrastructure. Riches is our opportunity to address some of those structural issues highlighted as far back as 2005 to 6. It will link resources, people, collections and expertise and importantly make those resources findable, accessible and available for use. The infrastructure headquarters will commission research on AHRC's behalf and coordinate the infrastructure. And the network of facilities will build on what already exists with gaps being filled by investment. We want to show the public value of heritage science and increase its efficiency and effectiveness in pure theoretical and applied research. The current timetable is that bids will be invited to be part of the network of facilities in spring 2023. Um, and that um, the programme, the infrastructure, will come into operation in 2024. So Riches will address not only equipment needs, but also staffing, expertise and connectivity. Um, some of the elements are funded in different ways. Um, it will also be our point of connection into the Eris Eric. The UK node would operate from within the Riches headquarters or hub, and that 
hub would support the UK infrastructure contribution to ERIS, as well as promote access to ERIS facilities by UK users. So our current focus is on achieving UKRI funding of the infrastructure component. This is capital funding for setup. It is not running costs or operational staffing or access. But the model is that these costs will be funded by other budgets from AHRC. So I hope that this has um, helped you to understand where we are at the moment, um, that we're trying to build on what already exists, fill gaps, and ensure connectivity. Thank you very much for your time and your attention, and I hope that the overview of our journey has been helpful to you. On this slide, I've got some links um, to the publications that I've mentioned to those various different parts of um, infrastructure development. And I've included both the NHSF uh, email address through which you can contact me if you'd like to, but also the uh, address of our AHRC infrastructure team, who I spoke to before this presentation. They're very happy to be contacted as well if you have questions about their work. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Caroline. Feels like that was a lot of work <laughs> compromised to a few minutes. Uh, we have a few minutes also to, to questions to for Caroline. Tor Brostrom, Uppsala University. Uh, thank you much, very much for an inspiring presentation. I think we have a lot to learn from, uh, from you and from the UK. Um, the, uh, the, the infrastructure that you showed obviously had a focus on, on natural science and technology. Uh, but uh, I'm curious about the scope of the National Heritage Science Forum as a whole, uh, what is included and what is not. Okay. So um, NHSF is, um, its charitable status means that it's around um, developing uh, and delivering public good, basically. And it does that through heritage science um, and through the activities of our member organisations as well. So we have um, contributed to contributed to all of these initiatives that relate to infrastructure, but the forum's own remit is broader than that. Um, so it is looking, um, for instance, at particularly at those community strands around the people um, aspect of, of how heritage science develops and is used in the UK, um, and about opening up opportunities for people to take part in the field. Our careers report that um, I mentioned uh, revealed, I don't think it'll be a surprise to you, a, a field that's very dominated by people with many, many, many qualifications. And that isn't necessarily all that is needed. And I think particularly that comes back full circle to infrastructure, where one of the things that's been um, highlighted through the consultation processes is that there's a real, real need for the um, for technician capability to support the infrastructure and its de delivery. Um, so we're trying to look at broadening access to the field um, uh, from all levels through to the people that are actually doing it, but also as part of sort of community awareness raising at the, at the school age end as well. So it is this sort of question about what is heritage science. Um, <laughs> like archaeological science, we're going with it's everything. Her heritage science is, is a, a broad term and we're specifically uh, loose in, in drawing boundaries around that because we want feel people to feel part of it, um, but without feeling that they need to disconnect from their own disciplinary backgrounds. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-on question on exactly that topic, um, the education and heritage science. So this the second point there, the science and heritage program between 2007 and 14. It was 48 projects. There were 48 PhD students, right? No. No? No, those were the um, research projects. So it was a smaller number of PhD students and the fellowships. Okay. Um, and then there was another one that wasn't in your slides, or maybe I missed it. The CIHA program yep. from UCL that had 60 PhD students? Yep, that sounds right. Yep, so CIHA was in my... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, this oh, is and the, these other things. <laughs> yeah. um, what happened to all these people? Is that included in the report by the... Uh, the three people that you, the no. three fellowships? No, no it isn't. Um, and it's a good question. So I think that's where um, NHSF um, could very usefully do a bit of work. So our most recent sort of comprehensive uh, sort of look at, at who's doing what is, is still that 2009 picture. 
and that needs to be updated. And again, that has been brought into sharp focus by the infrastructure development work. Um, our research community is still very international in the UK, but that's not been made easy uh, over recent years. So um, we need to we need to you know understand that community better. Um, and, and find out yeah, where all those people have gone. Because one of the things that we found in, our, in the 2017 careers report is that people did, some people naturally became disillusioned with the career in heritage science because things like uh, pay tend to be dominated by the pay structures of heritage organizations, which are less good, generally speaking, than those of the scientific um, domain. And so people transfer out. Um, so we have a job of work to do in keeping people within heritage science, but also I think celebrating that tr potential transferability of skills um, within and back in, in and out of the sector. Thanks, that was extremely useful. <laughs> um, you mentioned a problem with grant applications being considered too sciencey to be heritagey and too heritagey to be sciencey. Yeah. And I recognize that from environmental archaeology where things are too archaeological to be ecology and too ecology to be archaeology. Is that resolved now? Or <laughs> <laughs> is it no, <laughs> oh. not yet. But, but it is one of the things that we hope that, that this um, infrastructure investment will help to achieve as well. So the infrastructure program does not come with a program of research funding. But um, hopefully if you have better understanding of, um, of the domain of the research and, and its scope, there will be uh, further appetite for, for investment through um, different strands. And um, although UKRI is formed to bring together the research councils, I think it's fair to say that the reality is that the funding streams still go down through the different strands of, say, the Physical research, uh, Sciences Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and that is a persistent problem. Um, but it's one that I think is, is becoming easier to deal with. Okay, and a follow-up question? Um, that sounds very similar to Sweden. Um, so a, a related issue is, it sounds like we have the same kind of funding, that the infrastructure funding can't do pay for research. But yeah. as, but there's no specific pot of money set aside for research using the infrastructure. Is that different in the UK? Have the funding councils decided we're going to fund this infrastructure and then said we're also going to pay for this amount of research using the infrastructure in the future? They haven't committed to that, as far that, as, far as my understanding is. Um, but the current model, and it is all very live, as, as you've experienced, <laughs> there's plenty of potential for change. Um, but the current model is that the infrastructure headquarters would be um, coordinated by, if not part, of AHRC, our research council. And one of its functions would be to direct um, AHRC's strategic research funding. So that's what's um, there at concept level where the precise pounds for that research funding come from at this stage is not known. So the, the steps are the establishment of the infrastructure and the investment in that first, because there is this opportunity given the, the wider uh, UK government appetite for infrastructure investment. Okay. Um, I uh, suppose we thank Caroline one more time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.